In 2019, a group of chief executive officers of nearly 200 major U.S. corporations issued a statement with a new definition of the purpose of a corporation. There is a new imagination reaching for a more expansive vision to invest in employees, deliver value to customers, deal ethically with suppliers, and support outside communities. This expanded horizon is now at the forefront of American business goals. In 2020, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the simultaneous impacts of a global pandemic and the police killing of Minneapolis and George Floyd have left painful and indelible scars on every citizen and in every institution, the business community has the opportunity to provide leadership in the spirit of this expanded horizon. Not a top-down kind of leadership, rather, a listening and shared rebuilding and shared re-envisioning of the community kind of leadership. Minneapolis and downtown Minneapolis are fortunate to have community leaders and community voices who are expert navigators from whom the business community can learn and follow in our rebuilding and re-envisioning effort. On a warm August day in 2020, I had the privilege of speaking with four such navigators. The idea of the Opportunity Center really is to be able to have different services in one spot. Just to be a part of a bigger community, uh, I think is gonna be amazing for our residents. So I just, I really believe that um, us being a part of the Elliott neighborhood is going to be phenomenal for our residents and I think that we're going to see such a major growth. It's just going to be amazing. I just can't wait to be a part of it. Uh, success would be that they stay safe and they know they're not alone. Gentlemen who have been on the streets for 10 years plus are now saying, I can't go back. Please help me find homes. And they have been people who have perhaps turned it down in the past because there is a community around here. If you don't need our help, you don't see it. We are literally next to your office building or your park or your future hotel development site. Through our work in uh, racial equity, social justice, grassroots advocacy, and then in the direct program service delivery, um, I, I ask folks to to stop and, and look and see our name and pause and think about why and what we do. If you pause long enough to, to know a little bit more, you cannot help but care. And then once you care about what you're doing, you will join us and act. These four leaders are key operational and executive staff of Catholic Charities of St. Paul in Minneapolis a nonprofit organization with nearly 600 employees that is in its 150th year of service to the community. This organization is a critical element of the social and civic infrastructure in the Twin Cities region and notably in downtown Minneapolis. The incredible challenges of the past several months have truly revealed what this organization is made of. The vision of Catholic Charities is poverty for no one opportunity for everyone. Catholic Charities serves those most in need, with 29 programs in 18 locations and at sites throughout the community serving nearly 23,000 women, men, children, and families focusing on those at risk of homelessness, older adults, and people with disabilities. Catholic Charities responds in three ways, preventing poverty, meeting basic needs in times of crisis, and creating pathways out of poverty. First stop, Exodus Health Supported Housing for women and men over 55 years of age. I got into this work because um, my dad was a Navy man and so I was a Navy brat. and. We moved here to there, here to there, here to there. Um, a lot of times we were homeless living in um, hotels and stuff like that. And uh, my heart is just there. Hello, my name is Janelle Sullivan. 
I am the property manager here at Exodus Residence. Exodus is located downtown Minneapolis, in the heart of Minneapolis. Exodus serves 97 uh, persons transitioning from homelessness. Um, we have 79 transitional beds, we have 10 respite beds, and we have six veteran beds. All residents are, are provided a case manager. Uh, case managers help with uh, alleviating barriers um, for residents here at Exodus um, in order to get them into their own housing. And so we really, really try to um, help people to get over those barriers that are getting in their way, you know, for them to get out here and live market rate. So welcome to our female respite room. Um, we have contracts with North Memorial and also Hennepin County. One of the great things about um, persons being able to come here um, off the streets is having their own privacy. It's an amazing thing to uh, watch people heal. The more we make our residents a part or feel like a community, you know, they're not on their own anymore. They're not in shelter. They're not, you know, fending for themselves. They have somebody that cares and, you know, is here to support them. Exodus is such a perfect example of how much Catholic Charities is a part of our social infrastructure. We are literally downtown Minneapolis, uh, right in the middle of all the skyscrapers, providing homes to nearly 100 men and women who need a little extra help to build that stability and get out on their own. Without this, they would be homeless, they would be ill, they would not be surviving. Really excited to be here in front of what we hope to be the future Exodus 2. I will note that there's a plan for that name to change. Um, we are just a few blocks from our original Exodus, but that location um, is closing. The lease is ending and uh, we made a commitment to uh, do as much as we can to expand and improve the services that we provide at that older location. And so here we are. Um, right in the heart of Elliott Park neighborhood. Uh, this facility, the former Augustana Homes, is a building that will allow us to double uh, the people we are serving, the residents we're supporting, and the offers that we're able to provide. Uh, at this uh, site, we'll have over 170 apartments for single adults. Uh, they will have veterans preference, uh, which is something we carry across our sites at Catholic Charities. Uh, and then we will also have a wing for recuperative care, which is our partnership with Hennepin County and Healthcare for the Homeless, where uh, if I am a homeless person suffering from influenza or um, frostbite in the winter, and I am in the emergency room receiving the care that I need, and then it's time for me to rest and recuperate, but as a homeless person, I have nowhere to go. That person will now be able to be discharged into our care right here and under a nurse's supervision and brought back uh, through health and healing. And while they're with us, hopefully be able to secure more permanent housing going forward into the future. We are also going to consolidate a Catholic Charities administrative staff and our aging and disability services team um, onto this location. So at any given afternoon, we'll have over 100 uh, employees, office workers, nurses, social workers, um, working here in and out of the building, enjoying the beautiful park, enjoying all of the amenities of Elliott Park and, um, and bringing a community back to a site that has been slowly closing over the last many years. Something incredible about this opportunity is to watch the city of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, and the state of Minnesota work really hard at working together on providing deeply, deeply affordable housing. And to do that, um, they have broken records. Uh, to fund this site, we received the largest award 
in state history for housing infrastructure bonds. Uh, we received incredible uh, investments and support from Hennepin County and most recently from the city of Minneapolis. Transitional housing is important, and yet permanent and long-term affordable housing is always the ultimate goal. Higher Ground Minneapolis is a game changer in that regard. Located in downtown Minneapolis, on the west side of the North Loop neighborhood and next to the Minneapolis Farmers Market, Higher Ground is an innovative and award-winning design solution for bridging adults from street homelessness to permanent housing solutions. Higher Ground is our two stories of emergency shelter and then stories above that of our permanent apartments um, where people have leases and pay rent and have possibly moved from an emergency shelter guest up into a permanent apartment. Also on this campus behind me are two other apartment buildings, Glenwood and Evergreen, each of them serving over 80 single adults in their own apartments. Uh, Glenwood uh, helps those with uh, acute uh, chronic alcohol substance use disorder and Evergreen is a regular permanent supportive housing, which is to say renters who sign leases and live with us long into the future until they secure an apartment or a different home of their own. And it's, I want to just acknowledge that we have over 250 permanent homes on this campus. and when it's not COVID, have been serving as many as 200 individuals a night in emergency shelter. Uh, we believe strongly that housing is healthcare, that our continuum is really about people's health and well-being, and we're really doing all of that right here on this campus, just outside the edge of downtown. I worked in the restaurant business for 35 years, and then I stayed home and was taking care of my folks, and somebody called me up and said, would you like to work in mental health? And I said, no, it scares me. <laughs> and they said, oh no, we think you'll fit really well. And the surprising thing was I fit really well. <laughs> it is um, exciting to be able to make a difference, but it's also using all the skills that I've gained along life um, from restaurant work, which is just putting out fires, satisfying customers, good customer service, working with the team. And this is a lot of those same situations. The fact of being homeless creates a trauma within your life and that we need to approach these gentlemen from a different point of view. Um, how can we help you versus how are we gonna make you follow the rules and get everything done? So um, we're going for a more empathetic approach within the shelter. Recently, they're either being discharged from the hospital and they don't have a place to go, so they've been dropped off here. We've seen an increase in people with memory issues coming to us, um, which has been a new challenge. Uh, we also have people who are newly homeless, due to the fact that they couldn't pay rent and they were um, evicted out of their apartments. We do have um, Health Care for the Homeless, which is um, a clinic and they run three days a week. They've also been really helpful in some of our mass testings. It used to be that uh, they would have to bundle up their linen every single morning, put it back in the garages um, with their name on it and then um, take all their stuff and travel all day long with it. So with the rolly suitcase out in six inches of snow, um, that kind of stuff. Now we got lockers this spring, which has been wonderful. And um, the clients can leave their stuff. And I've had multiple clients say, now I don't look homeless because I get to leave my stuff and I don't have to carry it with. So pay for stay it is um, 80 bunks up here and this originally was set up for people who were working or actively looking for work and also um, actively interested in housing. And so um, we had 80 gentlemen that were paying the $7 a day or $42 a week and saving up a little bit of an account so that they could be moved on. It looks a little different than the last time. Oh, you've added color. I got it colored. Oh my goodness. One of the things the guys say the most, and we see it both here and in the hotel, 
they get to lock a door. They get to close a door, lock it, and for the first time in years feel safe. And that's like a lot of times their first time asleep. And either we will see them land in a room um, and they're so excited that they can't sit still and the quiet is bothering them, or they will go in and sleep for two weeks because it's the first good sleep that they've had in a very long time. We have in here two free washers, two free dryers. That includes um, detergent, which they can get from downstairs. In these rooms, we could have a floor meeting. Uh, we could have a memorial if somebody on our floor passed away. Uh, we have a spiritual director and um, we'll lead that. And we also may have a party. I had one gentleman who set a goal for himself when I was doing case management um, that he wanted to create a lunch with all the guys on the floor to build community. While Higher Ground is a centerpiece of Catholic Charities' innovative approach to ending homelessness, there is another critical component that is just as needed, place-based opportunity centers located in areas of over-concentrated poverty. Next stop, the Mary F. Fry Opportunity Center located in the Elliott Park neighborhood. My name is Femi Ogun. Um, I'm the program manager here at the Opportunity Center. Uh, right now, we are uh, serving lunch. We uh, usually serve three rounds of each meal, uh, 20 minutes each, especially since the start of the COVID-19. This is uh, part of the building where Hennepin County uh, you know, Healthcare for the Homeless is. Uh, they come in on Mondays through Thursday to provide healthcare services for our clients. There are also uh, social workers through Hennepin County that comes to provide uh, services for our clients. Uh, in about an average of a month, they'll see like about 90 plus you know, clients uh, and help them with different um, uh, services. For me, uh, I have a very interesting uh, story about how I got into uh, this career. Uh, living in New York um, many years ago, 9-11 happened and I happened to walk uh, very close to uh, the World Trade Center and I uh, had the honor to volunteer with the firefighters that were clearing the rubbles out of Ground Zero. I um, decided to change career, went to school to go get my uh, degree in human services. Uh, it was a 360 degree change of career for me. Uh, I had my first degree in um, agricultural science and uh, majored in economics. And uh, so 9-11 um, happened and uh, that, that was what changed it for me. Yeah, so, you know, uh, just at the back of of me here are pictures. Uh, one of Catholic Charities' uh, programs is, uh, you know, is to help those who are interested in the food industry. It's a 10-week program, and there's a two weeks of internship. We have had a lot of successful uh, stories, you know, uh, for those who, you know, who have come through the program. You know, how I measure success, you know, uh, for those who comes in here is when I see a client who I don't even remember comes back in, you know, in two weeks. It could be months time and 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 tell us that, oh, I have my own place now, or oh, I was able to uh, get a job. Hey, you guys help me. Is there anything I can do to give back? The downtown Minneapolis vicinity and its seven central and near neighborhoods 
have seen unprecedented reinvestment over the last eight years, with new and more people moving into the neighborhoods who have never experienced life together across the extraordinary and beautiful differences that are here, including our residents who are seeking to transcend their personal barriers to lead more prosperous lives. Given the rapidly changing neighborhoods, the work of bridging across groups and people is needed now more than ever before. Wendy Underwood is someone who understands these opportunities with clarity and purpose on all levels of our collective civic imagination. So, Wendy, <laughs> thank you for sitting down and taking yeah. time to be a part of this conversation to introduce the whole world of Catholic Charities, but especially for the city of Minneapolis, what Catholic Charities does in the city of Minneapolis. Who are you? What are your <laughs> passions? And what has brought you as a leader to the role that you do now? Sure. I would thank you so much for this opportunity. And it's been a blast getting to show you around our incredible uh, programs, our incredible teams, and of course, the incredible people we serve. I, I am Wendy Underwood, and I have the great pleasure of serving as our Vice President for Social Justice Advocacy and Engagement. And I recognize that's a mouthful, but that's because we have a lot, a lot to do uh, in our, that space. At Catholic Charities, our mission is to um, serve those most in need and advocate for those whom we serve. And that's the part that uh, I get to do and it's just has been an incredible privilege uh, every day. My background is in service, uh, uh, predominantly working in government at the state, local, and federal level. I do have private sector experience. I had a great opportunity at Target Corporation for a while. And so uh, bringing that all together at Catholic Charities, along with some time in public policy on human service delivery, just blends all together for me to be able to understand where the policies come from that are intended to help people in need, uh, where the um, public and private sectors uh, come together, where they need to be coming together to support this work. And then now being with a direct provider, having that opportunity to connect and learn from and really truly advocate for the people and the staff um, who we serve. That is wonderful. I find an interesting part of your world, uh, it, it's integrated. Yeah. You are integrated in a yeah. sense of like, what brings me purpose? Yeah. Where is my skill set? And then yeah. how can I sort of serve the broader good? Well, Catholic Charities is in its 150th year, an amazing milestone <laughs> amazing. year that we are celebrating. Yeah. And uh, we have spent this whole day touring multiple sites uh, please weave for me together the narrative, and I'll, I'll call it uh, a safety net within the safety net because I've been just dazzled by the people that we have met, by the spaces that we have gone to, by the use of property for common good and for helping those who need some uplift or maybe that next step, yeah. and just finding peace within on their own journey. How does this fit together? And, yeah. and it didn't happen overnight, 150 years. <laughs> I know so that's a broad question, yeah. but feel free to sew together some of the mosaic of what we've just experienced over these last three hours together in touring yeah. sites. Yeah, absolutely. And we never really left downtown Minneapolis, uh, which I think is uh, a really strong statement on how much we are a part of uh, the social infrastructure of this city and of the region. Um, so I mentioned our uh, mission is to uh, serve those most in need and advocate for those whom we serve. Um, we believe strongly that the, um, the work on the, the structure um, that leads to homelessness, uh, that leads to injustices in housing and um, racial inequities uh, are all things that we are um, mission driven to address and reform uh, because that really uh, truly is uh, the second half of a way we can help the people we serve. And the first half is to provide that sense of safety, provide that roof, provide that hot meal. And so today we really got to see the whole entire continuum of care. One of the things that has come through many times as we did the site tours was the convergence of health medicine and housing. We all know that permanent housing is the ultimate solution 
how does health and medicine, which you have woven into every one of your properties, yeah. play a role, an integrating role, and how do you even define that as sort of a core through line of your work? Sure. Uh, we absolutely believe strongly and advocate for others to recognize that housing is health care, that the uh, to have a roof and a door is both the safety that allows a person to actually sit and rest and sleep uh, and uh, the the physical emotional mental health that just a good night's rest brings any single one of us is a very real very tangible thing and so if you have gone days months years without that um, think of the health of your body your soul your mind well um a question that's been on a lot of our minds regarding the killing of George Floyd, and even as we were leaving one of the facilities, we ran into one of the clients that you serve, and he was deeply impacted by that and actually shared a, a, a similar story as to what he's experienced. Yeah. Um, how has the killing of George Floyd and the acknowledgement that we have seen and known, I mean, this is an everything gap, and that black and brown bodied individuals have always had the most impact because of the long history of the United States, our inability to address racism in all of its forms and how it has direct flow to the those who are most vulnerable and who I know Catholic Charity serves. And so as that happened, um, can you offer some comment as to how did you experience the impact with those that you serve how did your staff and institution um, lean in to frame it? I mean, obviously I've seen a lot of visuals going around the properties of solidarity with George Floyd and with that conversation needing to change how we interact not only between the police and the public, but just everybody interact with one another. So can you offer some comments about the impact of the killing of George Floyd and what that means to you as a leader and the institution and those you serve? Those things um, went deep, went deep for us um, across the organization. Uh, but I also want to recognize 70% uh, of the people we serve are people of color. Over 60% of our team members across Catholic Charities are people of color. Uh, the experiences with law enforcement, with uh, regular racism every day, with uh, injustices, with unfairness, um, with lack of opportunities, are things that um, the people um, I work with and, um, and, and offer help to every day experience. And how we address that um, as a team internally, as a, as a large nonprofit organization, is something that we work on every day. Um, we try to get better at every day. Uh, and during this time of, um, with uh, Mr. Floyd's death, with COVID, with all of the anxieties, um, really pressing hard down on our team members who couldn't drive home during the riots because of curfews and or whose um, families' homes were uh, you know, affected or other businesses looted, or they'd already lost their second jobs um, because of COVID and then the impacts of George Floyd, all of it, just the weight of it uh, has been very, very hard, very uh, challenging and, um, and something that we work through by really open, candid dialogues, by bringing people together to feel safe and supported and, um, and not alone uh, through it. Uh, so us internally as an organization, we're always every day working on um, anti-racism efforts and our own uh, racial equity within the organization. Anything else that you would like to share? If you don't need our help, you don't see it. We are literally next to your office building or your park or your future hotel development site. Through our work in uh, racial equity, social justice, grassroots advocacy, and then in the direct program service delivery, um, I, I ask folks to, to stop and, and look and see our name and pause and think about 
why and what we do. If you pause long enough to, to know a little bit more, you cannot help but care. And then once you care about what you're doing, you will join us and act. It's in, it's, you can't not, it's inevitable. And so I just, I would ask a person to pause to think about it because then I guarantee you will care and you will wanna join us. Thank you for that. Thank you for uh, taking me around to many properties <laughs> and introducing me to Absolutely. so many of the talented and passionate staff Absolutely. who do the day-to-day -day work and fill in what you said, like the invisible but visible presence of your life-giving social services that bring uplift and bring a wholeness yeah. to all that we are. Uh, on behalf of the organizations that I have the privilege of being a part of, on behalf of Minneapolis, and especially downtown Minneapolis, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Dan. For the day, for the time, for the organization, and uh, may our conversation and all that you're doing bring up left to our community in this very difficult year and in this very difficult moment. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. This fall, Catholic Charities is working to raise $1 million through its Hope in Action campaign. Keep an eye on social media to learn more. What a fitting phrase, hope in action. Because we all have the power to bring hope to someone else's life through real, concrete actions we take every day. That's what the team at Catholic Charities is doing and I'm grateful to the downtown businesses and individuals who generously support this important mission. Thank you. Community leaders and practitioners such as Wendy, Janelle, Christine, and Femi, and dozens, no, hundreds of others representing essential infrastructure community-based organizations such as Catholic Charities are here to co-navigate our city through COVID-19 and through civic unrest toward a shared future where all of our citizens flourish. This moment is ours to define. resident who was, uh, you know, he would be in fights all the time and I, I had constantly had him in my office, you know, and I'm just like, you got to get this together. What can we do? What can we do? Well, finally, you know, I had to end up putting him out. He comes back, turns out he started a book. He uh, started college, uh, drove up in his truck to show me, Janelle, just come out. And I want you to see this. I want you to see what I've done, you know? Had you not put me out, I don't know that I would have been able to do this for myself. And he honestly said, um, and it stuck to me, uh, he said, you know, what you do, you genuinely care about people and it shows. And so that to me is what I hear in the morning when I wake up and I'm happy to come to work. You want to say anything about your apartment? Um, I love it. I love it. Um, two years ago, I slept under a tree, and now look at—I'm the richest man in the world. <laughs>